leave a couple more blank lines here, about three, and we'll come back and fill them in in a minute. So let's talk about things like aspirin. When you did the work in the lab and you looked at aspirin, you realized that those types of compounds have very low melting points. In fact, they were the only ones that melted in the lab. They don't conduct electricity in their solid form, and most of them are non-electrolytes. There are a few that will conduct electricity a little bit, and we'll get more into detail about that in a later unit, but for right now, we're just going to say that they are non-electrolytes. They have irregular shapes. They're kind of uh, different shapes depending on what you looked at. Uh, the wax I kind of chunk up with a little scupula. The aspirin I grind, and so it's all different kinds of chunky sizes. And they're always made from all non-metals. So, for example, the formula for aspirin is C9H8O4. And you can see carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Those are all non-metals. If you look, this is a molecule of acetyl salic salicylic acid, or uh, what we know as aspirin. And what happens is each of the little lines there between the elements, like here, O and C, that represents a shared pair of electrons. So if you've ever been to a potluck dinner, um, my husband has this big family and we have about 60-ish uh, people in our family when we get together for holidays and things like that. And so we always have a potluck. It would be a lot of work for somebody to bring all the food for all those people. And so everybody brings their best dish and everybody shares with everybody else. I like to bake, so I usually bring desserts. My sister-in-law, Connie, always brings deviled eggs. She makes really good deviled eggs. Somebody always brings fried chicken, right? You've been to these church dinners and things like that, so somebody always brings fried chicken. So those are the kinds of things. That's a potluck dinner. Everybody brings and everybody shares. The same thing happens with compounds that are like aspirin. So those shared pairs of electrons are what hold the atoms together. The uh, attraction of the nucleus of the atom for those both of those electrons in that shared pair helps pull those two atoms together. And they have a distinct beginning and a distinct end. Unlike the ionic compounds like sodium chloride where they just kind of seem to go on and on and on, you can see this is what a molecule of aspirin looks like. So it has kind of this hexagonal ring and then these little chains hanging off of it. And we call that a molecule. So when we're talking about a molecule, we're usually talking about a covalent compound. Every molecule has a certain number of atoms. So when we give the formula for a covalent compound, there are actually nine carbons, eight hydrogens, and four oxygens. And you can see that looking at the picture. If you have one line, like you do in between carbon and oxygen here, that's one single bond. Remember that it's a shared pair, so that single bond is two electrons. If you have a double bond, like you do between these two carbons or between this carbon and oxygen, that's two lines, so think about how many electrons that would be. That would be four electrons, and we call that a double bond. This compound doesn't have any, but in some cases you can even have a triple bond. So it would have three lines between the atoms, and that would be six electrons. When you melt things like aspirin, the bonds between the atoms don't break. Covalent bonds are really strong, but what typically happens is there are attractive forces between the molecules that break. We call those intermolecular forces. Remember that inter means between. And so those attractive forces break and those molecules can kind of slide past each other. And intermolecular forces are really weak compared to things like bonds. So it just doesn't take a whole lot of energy to break them. And that's why they were the first ones to melt. And there, so that gives them melting points that are really low. So go back up to your little space. These are uh, elements that form covalent bonds. So they share electrons to make compounds, and those are things like aspirin. Let me go back and show you our animation, and we'll look at that for covalent bonding. It's the same animation. I'm just going to choose covalent instead of 
ionic. So remember that co, think about the word covalent. Co means together or shared. Valent means valence electrons. Okay, so covalent means shared valence electrons. So you can see here's carbon and two oxygens. That would be carbon dioxide. And you can look, they combine together to form a molecule of carbon dioxide. And if you look, each of the oxygens has six electrons in its valence shell, while carbon only has four. So let's see how this whole sharing thing works. So the six electrons for oxygen, it wants to have eight. Carbon only has four in its outside shell, but it wants to have eight as well. So what happens is, when oxygen needs those two, it comes over and shares with carbon. So you can see that there are two electrons here and two electrons here. That would be a double bond. And two of the electrons, the blue ones, came from the oxygen. And the other two, the pink ones, came from carbon. Now, this oxygen's in good shape. It has two, four, six, eight. So it has that full octet. But carbon doesn't. And so what happens is carbon will go ahead and bond again with another oxygen atom and form two double bonds. So it actually has a double bond on each side that allows it to have eight electrons in its valence shell. And then the oxygens each have eight in their valence shells. And so the nuclei from each of those atoms is attracting both of the electrons in each of those pairs and that's what holds that uh, compound together. You've got the nuclei pulling on the electrons from, that are being shared between those atoms, and that's what allows us to have that uh, covalent compound, what holds them together. All right, last one, I promise. Leave a couple more blank lines. All right, let's talk about things like zinc. First of all, why do I have a copper penny with zinc? Well, hopefully you remember from the demonstration we did at the very beginning of school that pennies are now made with zinc with a very thin shell of copper. And they tend to have very high melting points. They do conduct electricity in the solid state. And you guys know this because you love things with wires like cell phone chargers. And typically they have wires that are made of things like copper. Copper is a great conductor of electricity and heat. So it's used in a lot of things like electrical wires, or sometimes if you go home, your mom might have pans that have copper on the bottom. They conduct heat and electricity really well. They don't form solutions. We noticed that when we tried to do our conductivity. We know that they conduct in their solid form, but they won't dissolve into those aqueous solutions, and so they are non-electrolytes. Even though they conduct electricity in the solid form, they don't conduct it in a solution. They have an irregular shape, and the ones, the ones that we saw, sometimes they look like they have a regular shape, but that's usually because it's been given to it. So somebody's hammered it into a sheet, or I cut it with my scissors into a little rectangular piece. But the fact that it's malleable, remember that malleable means it can be bent to form different shapes. The fact that it's malleable allows it to have, it's because that has that irregular shape. And they're always made from all metals. So for example, if you have anything in your house that's brass, that's actually a mixture of copper and zinc. So let's look at how those bonds form. What you have is these metal atoms that are sitting there close together. And you've got the little ions here and the electrons will leave their home atom and move around through the different uh, metal atoms. And it creates metal ions. They've lost electrons. And the electrons will move freely through the whole piece of metal. And what will happen is when you start a current, it'll, those charges will move all the way through. And I'll show you the, another animation in a second. But we call that a sea of electrons. You've got those atoms or ions sitting there, and these electrons are kind of swimming around them.
and we say that those electrons are delocalized. So when you think of something being local, you think of it as being kind of close to home. Delocalized means that they leave their home atom, their quote unquote home atom, the atom that they started with, and they move around between the other ions. And when metal melts, what happens is some of those attractions are broken. And so it breaks those metallic bonds. And so the melting points are really high. Remember when we break uh, bonds, that causes melting points to be really high. And because of that sea of electrons, metals have their shapes changed. So we say that those are malleable because that sea of electrons allows those ions to move around. They can be pulled into wire. That word is ductile. So things that can be pulled into wire are ductile. And they're also shiny. We say that that is lustrous or typically you think of metals, you think of them as being shiny. And that has to do with those electrons moving around the orbital. So think back to unit three when we talked about spectroscopy. You've got electrons that are moving around in their orbitals and they're giving off some visible light. That's what makes those elements shiny. So with metallic bonding, you've got that sea of electrons that holds the atoms together. Those electrons are delocalized. They're moving around from ion to ion. Let's really quickly look at this animation. And I promise that'll be the end of this slideshow. And me talking. All right, so let's go ahead and look at our little animation here. And now we're going to pick out metallic. So remember that metallic bonding comes with compounds that are uh, all metal atoms. So copper and zinc, that makes brass. And so what happens is when you have those atoms, they only usually have one or two electrons in their outside or valence shell. Copper usually has one. Remember that pseudo noble gas configuration. Zinc always has two. And so what happens is they form that electron cloud or that sea of electrons. And then those, those electrons will move as a unit. So if one or two electrons start moving, they all start moving. And so the, those electrons are attracted to the nuclei of all the different atoms. And you can see that these electrons here, they're attracted to the nucleus of this atom, but they're also attracted to the nucleus of this atom. And then the nucleus of this atom is attracted to the electrons from this atom. So there are lots of different, different attractions going on. And depending on how close together they are and how big the atoms are, they can be attracted to lots of different uh, atoms. And then what happens is the electron cloud will move freely when there's a voltage applied. So you can see the electrons are kind of moving past those ions and the valence electrons are gone. Those are the ones that are moving. And it also allows metals to transfer heat energy as well. So it's not just uh, electrical energy, but it's heat energy as well. Okay, so that was metallic bonding. Those are things like zinc. And that's it. Come to class and ask questions. We're going to talk about it tomorrow. Have a good day.